Welcome back, Ivor. Hey, thanks, Carl. Thanks, Richard. Great to see you guys again. So, Ivor, what spawned this conversation was we were talking to Gabor, who's one of our uh, admins on the Ketogenic Forums in the back channel, the admin channel. And uh, he was talking about um, some research that he had done about how insulin resistance develops and, you know, from a bottom up approach rather than an observational approach looking down into what causes this or what causes that or what causes this going backwards from the from the symptoms and from diabetes down he's sort of explained the process based on studies and research that he's done and he's a biologist from the bottom up and and you took this research and ran with it and are now uh explaining it in a very easy to understand way so i think I, i'm just gonna let you run with that ivor all right thanks carl well yeah gabor is uh, an extraordinary individual and i'd spent a couple of years kind of you know researching insulin resistance and i'm pretty fixated on the mechanisms too mm -hmm. not just on what you do to be healthy uh, but when i discovered gabor and his lower insulin facebook group i began to realize you know there's pieces there that i was missing so i always saw the liver as the kind of center of insulin resistance or yeah. hyperinsulinemia and I began to realize how important the adipose tissue or the fat tissue is. So that's where Gabor has kind of unearthed probably all of the steps as you progress through insulin resistance to type 2 diabetes. And would you say the core revelation is that fat cells become insulin resistant first? Pretty much essentially, yeah, that the fat cells become dysfunctional and that affects your systemic insulin sensitivity. Mm. Now, kind of simultaneously, if you're doing the bad thing, the rest of your system is taking some punches too. So it's not pure fat first and then pure switch to liver and muscle. But, but the adipose is an early problem that's very significant, we believe. And I've worked with Gabor over the months. Uh, I just downloaded actually our messages there to print out. And uh, I don't know, it's five or 600 messages over the last couple of months. <laughs> Doesn't <Wow>. surprise me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And nearly every one has a paper attached. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's awesome. so he is amazing. It's been, it's been fantastic. Yeah, so I credit him in my recent talks, which I gave at the Physicians for Ancestral Health in Miami last week, mm, which yeah. was all doctors. Yeah, they're good guys. Mm. So that was a pretty hardcore talk that will be released shortly. And then I did a higher level one touching on this and the usual material in the low carb USA keto getaway in Miami. Right. Anyway, Gabor, so we shared so many papers and he put me right on some of the mechanisms I wasn't so aware of. And I did a lot of research offline, always returning back to him, comparing notes. And essentially what comes out of it all is early on when you become um, a bit dysfunctional, you know, you put on a little weight and you begin to have a problem. It appears that the adipose tissue is a very important signaling organ. Now, I knew it was important for signaling, but I didn't realize it was a key place in the early stages. Right. What basically happens is essentially, and if you have parents who are type 2 diabetic, you'll end up with a, a, a poor insulin response inherently. So this genetic thing people talk about, yeah, there's a genetic factor. Right. But when they did studies on people whose parents were diabetic versus similar healthy 40-year-olds, and they even did 28-year-olds, and they looked at their insulin receptor system, hmm. they were able to uh, identify that the people with the parentage, even though they were completely healthy and all their bloods looked great, same as the non-parent guys, when they looked at their insulin response, it was much lower. Is this their insulin receptors systemically? Yeah, particularly the adipose tissue I was focusing on. Gotcha. But generally. Right, right. Yeah, they, they are more prone to becoming insulin resistant. And they can actually see that by measuring their insulin receptor substrate and their um, PI3 kinase pathways. So I won't get into that detail. Okay. But it's fascinating. But another interesting thing was all the guys with the parents who are currently healthy, no problems, they're slim. Mm. They have this low insulin receptor activity, but also the authors didn't realize, but I looked at their data, all of the parent guys failed the craft test. Ah, really? Yes, they failed it. Now, the authors of the study just showed 
post-glucose insulin curves and they yeah. didn't refer to craft and they just noted yeah these guys are a little higher in their insulin which makes sense mm. but i looked and uh, went through the data all the parent guys failed a craft test all the non-parent guys passed it incredible <laughs> and by parent guys you mean the the people whose parents had diabetes exactly yeah so all the parent the guys who had both parents with diabetes they all failed the craft test wow. and the people who had no family history all passed which makes sense but it shows you the power yeah of that test and these weren't necessarily diabetic no these were healthy this was the beauty right. uh, mm -hmm. i one study with 28 year olds they're all healthy, all good bloods matched, mm. but just one half have got both parents diabetic, one half no history. And the same with the 42 year olds, it does multiple studies and they all give the same result. <laughs> yeah, even though they're fully healthy and matched to people with no history, their insulin receptor is completely different and they generally fail craft tests. Wow. So they are exposed to the problem we're talking about much more during life and they need to eat much more carefully. Yeah, uh, They can yeah. still fix themselves. There's no problem. If they eat the proper diet, right. they never have to have the problem. Yeah, But they are more prone and you can see it in their genetic test of their receptors. So <laughs> what did this mean for the next phase of research? Right, so basically, well, if we get back to the adipose, so it would appear from lots of studies, and many of these are in the last 10 years, you know, these mm -hmm. are recent studies. Yeah. Uh, the adipose tissue, when it is meant to kind of soak up what you eat and then release it later when you're fasting. So I coined the term uh, adipo shield, and I'm ah, now viewing sure. adipose. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so I'm now viewing adipose tissue as an extremely important shield right. between what you eat, you know, and how your system can deal with it. So yeah. there's four types of people really. There's metabolic, metabolically healthy, normal weight, yeah, right, mm -hmm. and those guys have got a moderate amount of of fat tissue subcutaneous right. you know, fat tissue yeah. and it's very functional so it behaves beautifully and if they occasionally misbehave there's no problem no bullets get through to your system right mm. uh, and they're insulin sensitive naturally and they have very low risk for disease yeah then you have metabolically unhealthy normal weight and these guys are not fat they're slim mm. but they have um, not too much adipose tissue, more than the healthy guys, right. but they have more visceral adipose tissue in and around their organs. Right. Yeah. So those are tophies, yes. thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Exactly. And their fat tissue now is not expanding enough to, to take the bullets. Yeah. So essentially, they have a limited expansion, so they stay slim, but it's not performing its shield function anymore. Right. It's dysfunctional. And often that will lead to inflammation. Mm. And those guys have a problem. They're insulin resistant, hyperinsulinemic, and they carry the risk. Mm. Uh, the third part, type of person is metabolically unhealthy obese. Mm. And these are the classic, very heavy guys who are insulin resistant and they're metabolically unhealthy. Yeah, right. They've expanded their standard fat tissue hugely, right? Fine. And they have a lot of visceral adipose tissue built as well but it's not functioning. They're, they've passed their threshold of safe fat, even though they have lots of it, and it's becoming inflamed and it's no longer shielding them, right? So they're in trouble too. Yeah, they, right. they carry yeah. a lot of risk. And the last group that's really interesting, which I got a few papers from uh, Gabor and some of my own, are metabolically healthy obese. And these guys are just as big as the unhealthy guys, 45 BMI, one of the studies says, which is wow. pretty heavy, yeah. That, that's where I started, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but these guys, they've expanded their standard fat tissue and they have visceral fat tissue as well, quite a bit, not as much as the unhealthy guys, but it's still functioning well. And that's what distinguishes them. Their adipose tissue is not inflamed, doesn't have macrophage activity, it's working really well. And as a result, they're insulin sensitive, their trig over HDL looks okay, right. even their fasting insulin's okay. Right. All their metrics and their risk is low because their fat tissue has expanded a lot and it stayed functional. And their metrics and their risk is good. So you're saying people with uh, less fat cells, but bigger fat cells with more fat in them 
have a different risk factor than those with more smaller fat cells. Absolutely. And that's another point I made in my talk that it would appear, and I won't go into detail from twin studies where true twins were looked at, and these are hard to do, but they're mm -hmm. very revealing. A twin that becomes fatter than the, their, their co-twin, if they become fatter by having more fat cells, but they stay small, the fat cells, mm. they are safe. They actually don't show bad uh, metabolic parameters, and they're actually in pretty good shape. Whereas other twin pairs, and again, this is a great compare between slim and fatter twins, mm. they don't expand their number of fat cells so much, but the fat cells become hypertrophic. Uh, they right. get hyper, yeah, they get bigger. And when your fat cells begin to stretch bigger, it recruits immune activity and they become unhealthy. And that's when you begin to go into the cascade. And in these twin studies, the twins with fewer fat cells, but, but they're larger, right? Mm -hmm. Those guys had all the big livers. They had the CRP high. They had the high insulin resistance. They had all the metabolic disease. The full cascade, yeah. Yeah, whereas the fatter twins who had more fat cells, but they didn't get bigger, they healthily expanded. Uh, their metrics were as good as their brothers who were slim. Mm. I wonder how that happens. How does one tend to get more uh, fat cells that are smaller than, than bigger fat cells that are fewer? Well, actually, I, I uh, messaged back and forward with Mike Eads on this, and he had some great studies, and Gabor also have some as well. Um, when you get fat young, early in life, you tend to create more fat cells and you may end up more the safer type. And they've seen that in observational oh, studies, but they don't understand it because <laughs> they don't know about what I'm about to tell you. So, um, yeah, so if you, you can have protection from diabetes by becoming uh, overweight very early in life. Hmm. And if you become overweight later in life, it's less easy to create more fat cells from stem cells and are pre-adipocytes, broadly speaking. And you may end up stretching your capacity and making them larger. So that's very high levels simplification. Yeah. It's interesting and, because uh, I look at myself. I, I was a chunky kid, you know. I was I was I wasn't obese until I went to college, but uh, but you know, all throughout my you know early life, I was overweight. I became diabetic at age forty seven, and up until the point where I became diabetic, and just a year before my. My sugars and my blood pressure and everything looked okay. Yeah. So, you know, it just sort of snuck up on me. It's interesting to compare that with me. I was thin for, for uh, up until probably about 22 or 23 and then started to put on weight. I was uh, diabetic by 38. So I was diabetic 10 mm. years before Carl was. Uh, and I was, mm. a, I was the thin kid who, who put on the weight later on in age. Which, interesting. You know, that, that, that supports um, uh, Dr. Reed's. Um, suggestion. Well, there you go. N equals two. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> it lines up. And uh, yeah, and this is this is uh, but probably not uh, too much detail on this one. But it's a great question. It's interesting to know that there's even science and studies that even explain those side questions. So mm. basically, your fat tissue would appear uh, when you begin to push uh, over nutrition into your body or the bad types of foods mm. and you go towards insulin resistance, your fat tissue, what's really important about it is it has a thing called GLUT4, which uh, translocates uh, to the cell membranes of your fat cells and take up glucose. You know, people have told me I had four glutes before. You know, I walk into a room and they say, hey, Carl, have a couple of seats. <laughs> you got to clench those glutes, man. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, I know I'll keep it fairly simple. So anyway, this this uh, very important uh, mechanism in the fat tissue is to on the in a response to insulin is to take up glucose. Now, your fat tissue only takes up five or 10 percent of the glucose that's floating. So it's not like they're important to mop up lots of glucose. That's yeah, not right. the point. But it's important that the insulin switches on the glucose transport system mm -hmm. because there are secondary processes that occur when that's working properly. And those secondary processes uh, turn on de novo lipogenesis or the generation of lipids in the fat tissue. And yeah. these actually, many of them are signaling molecules. So you're not only talking about 
um, taking up sugar and moving it into fat cells as fat, but now you're talking about what's happening in the fat cell as well. You know, the creation of triglycerides exactly. and all of that. The creation of triglycerides, but also it appears from recent papers, a whole range of anti-diabetic, anti-inflammatory, fat-based signaling molecules that flow out to the liver and the system. Uh, I see. So, so previously, we were under the impression that it was the high insulin itself that was the signal, but it may be a step after that. Well, well high insulin is a signal, right? But, but the fat, what's going on in the fat cell is another signal. Yes, and many signals it would appear. Uh, wow. So I give an example that my people might be able to see it simply. In mouse experiments based on this, what they've done is gone in and they've switched off the glucose transport in just the fat tissue. So everywhere else, muscle and liver, everything's fine. Mice that only have a defect in the glucose transport in just their fat tissue. Now I'm fascinated by the technology behind that. I mean, how did they do that? Oh, it, <laughs> it's beautiful because they're called knockouts and this particular GLUT4 knockout, rather than knocking out the whole glucose transport, uh, which ruins the mouse basically, yeah. um, they managed to cross um, strain, it's quite complex, they knocked out just the glucose in just the adipose and verified everywhere else the glucose was fine, Wow, that's, perfect. That's great. Incredible. Yeah. What happened was those mouse mice were profoundly diabetic. Yeah. So they basically collapsed their system insulin sensitivity, they collapsed their whole system just by tweaking the glucose transport just in the fat cells. Because they were unable to, uh, to trigger off these mechanisms that send messaging to... Yes. Uh, right, so it's, yeah, literally mm. cut off all the signaling. Wow. You've cut off the signaling, and that's the way I now think of adipose, not just as a mop-up sponge or this sure. simplistic insulin gets the glucose out of the way right no think of the adipose as one of the master dial controllers signaling the whole system and keeping things healthy wow and they've done many experiments since where they've switched off de novo lipogenesis i mentioned in the in the just yep. the adipose tissue same thing so they can collapse a mouse systemically by tweaking these pathways in the adipose. So you're basically just expanding the granularity at which we understand this, you know, mechanism of what's of insulin resistance. You're saying, okay, it's not just that insulin is high, but when insulin is high, what happens? The the cascade effect mm. goes into, you know, when sugar gets taken up into a fat cell and, and converted to fat. And and then that particular fat cell is signaling all these things that we would previously attribute to just the insulin alone. Yes, it's another messenger system that's very important. Now that said, Carol, the person who has this problem, they will also be a bit hyperinsulinemic and the hyperinsulin will cause insulin resistance in many organs. Mm -hmm. So in parallel, that hyperinsulinemia, that's a problem as well. But now we add to it, there's multiple control systems going out of whack. Got it. And that, that's why it's so bad. Uh, one of the reasons it's so bad. Mm. So if you take that adipose signaling and leave that and say, wow, okay, that's interesting. And you've got hyperinsulinemia will go with the resistance mm -hmm. and resistance will build with the hyperinsulinemia. Mm -hmm. And everything's reinforcing itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's really a bunch of control systems that are all uh, referencing off each other. I mean, mm. you could call it a recursive function, right, Richard? Yeah, I guess it kind of is. It's a, it's a, a vicious cycle, really. Right. In software, yes. uh, a recursive function is one that calls itself. So, you know, the joke for recursion mm. is if you look it up in the dictionary, it says, see recursion. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And I remember from my Fortran in engineering programming, the while do loops and the for next. Oh, yeah, sure. And you could just get them to go around in circles. Yeah, well, the, I, I so, think of a lot of these things as 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 programming constructs because that's really that's that's mm. my understanding of control systems. And so, I can imagine, for example, uh, one simple mechanism to describe insulin resistance getting worse is uh, if your fat cells are becoming slightly insulin resistant. That means that they they are releasing free fatty acids and into a system that has insulin. Mm. And if you have free fatty acids in the in circulation and insulin, insulin will will drive them into other places such as creating ectopic fat inside your pancreas mm, and in your ectopic liver ectopic fat in the pancreas makes your pancreas 
you know, it ma makes it more insulin resistant. So, you mm. know, it, it, it's a series of it's a series of uh, systems that uh, that all lean upon each other, and when one of them is slightly out of kilter, it forces all the others to go out, out of kilter as well. Ivor, is there evidence to suggest that uh, this extra fat not only gets stored in the pancreas but in the liver and in the kidneys? Yeah, pretty much throughout over the long term, and when things get more advanced, you know, the fat will get begin to get stored all over the place generally speaking hmm. yeah but the liver is one of the most important places uh, i mean hyperinsulinemia in itself is destructive to the pancreatic beta cells yeah right uh, and also the ectopic fat as is glucose uh, absolutely so excessive hmm. quantities of any of these things so it's exactly as you you said there it's self-reinforcing because as you begin to develop the problem the problem itself begins to reinforce and accelerate the problem hmm. Yeah, you can actually stop the whole thing by just cutting off the inputs. You yeah. know, as we've seen from yes, you can stop Cut it. Carbohydrates. I mean, yeah, exactly. And in extreme cases, for people who are profoundly insulin resistant or diabetics who who have a lot of metabolic dysregulation, you may need to add fasting. Uh, you may need to restrict some of the fat, and you know, but but for a lot of people who are not too bad. It, carbohydrate restriction protein moderation will be enough input uh, alteration mm. to actually get things back which is fantastic it's an easy fix so if we're fairly quick about it then that's the fundamental adipose signaling thing another phase you can get into is adipose tissue inflammation yeah. and when that begins on your journey the inflammation will cause a lot more I mean tons more negative bad feedback loops mm -hmm. so as you get uh, macrophage are recruited because your fat cells are getting a little too big mm. it's a good response the body has done it for good reasons however it'll prevent more fat cell proliferation and growing yeah and it will also cause more insulin resistance through many known pathways now so the inflammation reaction will start making your adipose tissue more dysfunctional and will start it releasing more of the free fatty acids richard you mentioned into a system that does not need them. <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. But, but what can the body do? Because mm. the inputs are driving all of this, and you keep putting in the inputs, so you're really causing it, essentially. Right. Now, that's the inflammation. That's a big one, and it's later in your journey. Yeah. Right? It's after the initial dysfunction I discussed. Once you begin to get inflammation, in one report, they could predict the insulin resistance of the individuals 98% accurate just using the macrophage in their fat tissue, the amount of macrophage. Wow. wow, indeed. Wow. That's specific. Yeah. That's specific. And one more measure, that and the adiponectin, okay. which is a hormone released by the fat. Right. So again, you can predict the system insulin resistance with two um, fat-based measures. 98% of it. Yeah. So to give people an idea, this is huge. So yeah. that's the inflammation. Um, and then the next thing is what I call the uh, VLDL ApoB merry-go-round. Yeah. And this is essentially where once you get a little more insulin resistant, you can no longer process triglyceride properly. And they had one great study where people ate mixed, reasonably healthy meals, and they had slim guys and they had heavy guys who were a little insulin resistant, but their metrics weren't bad. Now, what do you consider a mixed, reasonably healthy meal? Um, well, uh, I looked it up. It was a standard mixed dietary guidelines type okay. meal. It was classic. In other words, food they pyramid. didn't feed food pyramid type stuff. So they, yeah. they didn't feed them known bad junk food to make them dysfunctional. They but they did have whole grains and fruits and things like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Right. So they're their orthodox healthy eating right so they fed them anyway three meals and tracked them over 24 hours and even though the blood metrics looked okay with the heavier guys and they were reasonably healthy what they did with the triglyceride from the meals and from their liver was massively different hmm. so hmm. what the slim guys did and they radio isotope labeled the fat from the meal and the fat in the ldl or cholesterol particles from the liver so they actually tracked where all the fat was going for the different wow. places. It was, it was really wow, cool. And in short, the slim guys were taking in the meals. They were taking huge amounts of the triglyceride from the meals into their fat tissue. 
beautifully, more mm. meals, more take up. And later when they were fasting, they sent it all out again as fuel. Wow. Beautiful battery system. Yeah. 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 That's the slim guys right. who were insulin sensitive. The heavy guys, not too heavy, little heavier. Um, they were actually taking up much less, half the amount of triglyceride from the meals into their fat. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Where was it going? Where's it going? Yeah, yeah. that's what I said. Where? To the liver. <laughs> the liver. You got it. <laughs> it's got to go to so, the liver. Of course. It goes to the liver. But, but get this. This is really fun. They radio tracked how much these guys were taking up from VLDL ApoB particles that come out of the liver. Right. And they found out that the slim guys were taking up not much. And they had low VLDL, right? Low ApoB. Yeah. But mm. the heavy guys were taking up twice as much triglycerides out of the VLDL ApoB particles. And they were taking that up into their adipose. So they were desperately trying to mop up triglyceride from ApoB, VLDL, the bad cholesterol, mm. right? Yeah. And their, their, their adipose was busy doing that. So you're right. There was a merry-go-round. Yeah. They were not able to take it up from the meal. It was going into the liver in chylomicrons, the liver was building up the fat and it has to export it the hell out of there in ApoB. Sure. Ooh, the bad cholesterol. And then the fat tissue is trying to mop that crap up. <laughs> it's, it's insane. Incredible. It's almost yeah. like the body says, as long as we keep stuff moving, you know, we'll be okay. Yeah. Right? It's a juggling act. Yeah. It's, it's, a jo it's a dysfunctional juggling act that yeah. I think it's just insane to an engineer, to any doctor who understands it. And those yeah. people weren't even, they didn't even have bad blood metrics yet, those heavy guys. Wow. But it shows you the craziness that's going on under the hood. So the primary problem here is that the, when the person eats the meal, they make chylomicrons in their gut, which are mm -hmm. lipoprotein, massive lipoproteins full of triglycerides. They send them off to the fat cells to be consumed, and the fat cells just aren't buying any. Mm. And so I assume they're arriving back at the liver as partially, partially deflated chylomicrons, chylomicron remnants. Exactly. So it's the fat cell refusing to buy that causes the whole problem. Yeah, or two, two sides of a coin. We can't prove exactly, but essentially that's what's happening. The chylomicrons can be uh, used in muscle for energy, uh, but if they're not, yeah, they should go to the adipose taken in and let out later when you're fasting. Sure. But in the guys who are dysfunctional, they ain't getting into the adipose. The receptor activity for those chylomicrons is lowered and the adipose ends up busy mopping up the ApoB triglyceride mm. after the chylomicron fat from the meal has gone through your liver. So that is, that is a, a tragedy. And mm. these people are early on their journey. They're not yet got free fatty acid metrics in their blood gone bad yet, mm. but they are hyperinsulinemic. And that's mm. where you're back to the hyperinsulinemia as the crucial marker, especially after a meal right. of all of this dysregulation. Yeah. And you can see it 20 years beforehand. Oh, generally, yeah. Uh, I mean, full blown diabetes in recent studies where they did craft tests 11 years before, nine years before, wow. you can predict, um, from your craft test, the best craft test patterns had a couple of percent diabetes 10 years later. Hmm. And right. the worst craft patterns were up to half of them were full blown. <gasps> wow. That, that, it's huge predictive That's a power. pretty specific test. Yeah. Awesome. And it turns out all this, all these researchers were doing the craft test and they didn't even know it. Yeah. They're just doing post glucose insulin and, but they don't know anything really generally about the patterns and crafts work in the seventies. Right. And remember craft was taking people with bad patterns and fixing them right. and getting them right back to his pattern one yeah. with low carb diets in 1972. Incredible. It was all the patient record, <laughs> yeah. but no one would listen to him because right. It's the fat had to be bad. Yeah, this whole um, uh, focus on the adipose tissue as being responsible for diabetes, it sort of reminds me of like the the, four, the, the blind man describing an elephant and each one describes a different part of the elephant. Mm. And, you know, mm. I, I remember when I was first diagnosed with diabetes, I had a very prominent endocrinologist, uh, a man by the name of uh, Ellis Samuels, who was in fact the first person in Europe to do an insulin assay. 
um, and studied mm. with Bershon and and Yellow. Wow. Um, and yeah, and and he was a very prominent man in the in the endocrinology field, and his attitude was it's obesity. He said he literally said to me, "If if I can't get your obesity fixed, then your diabetes will get worse. And so what I'm going to do is, if I can't get your obesity." Moving in the right direction within six months, we're going to start talking about bariatric procedures, right? Uh, lap, uh, laparoscopic mm. uh, uh, gastric bands and all those kind of things, which is it's incredible. To, that was his fixation, and then and then you know we we have uh, I mean Diabetes Australia and and the American Diabetes Association are also fixed on on fixated on uh, obesity as the cause of, yeah. of diabetes. And then we have other people who are focused on insulin resistance in muscles. Oh, well, you know, if, uh, if, uh, muscles become resistant to taking up glucose or uh, resistant to hearing the signal of insulin to take up glucose, then that starts that whole cascade off mm. as well. But, you know, the, the, the this fat specific or adipocyte specific focus on diabetes seems to get the initial step or at least one of the more important initial steps of the entire yeah, cascade. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and get it out there. And it's not the obesity that causes the problem, though it does. It's a good reflector that the problem may likely be there. Sure. Yeah, it's a symptom of the same problem. Yeah, it's a symptom in a sense. Um, and we've seen the metabolically healthy obese that show it's not the obesity. Some people can right. become obese in a healthy fashion. So sure, it's not yeah. the cause. And Gabor was actually great for pointing that out as well on the forum recently. You know, you, you can eat a lot of material and become overweight. But once your insulin and leptin signaling is still good, you're, you're still good. Yeah. Now, those people who are very heavy but insulin sensitive, they do over time have a higher likelihood of becoming dysfunctional than a slim person who's healthy. Sure. But that's really just because they're obviously pushing some of the wrong levers and over time they mm. will they will fall out of bed. Right, but, but, right. But yeah, yeah. at some point. Yeah. And yeah. um, just one point on the muscle, the tragedy of all the focus on muscle as being the insulin resistant important uh, organ is uh, the reason that happened is most of the glucose is taken up in the muscle and very little in the fat. Hmm. Right. So people always assume the muscle was more important, but they didn't know about the signaling I mentioned. Yeah. So that's why decades have been lost focusing on the muscle. One mouse study I have, at one week into a bad diet, the adipose tissue is profoundly insulin resistant and the liver is gone. The liver glucose production is out of control. And it's wow. only at three weeks that the muscle becomes resistant as a knock-on effect. One thing I didn't realize was that the muscle takes up glucose without insulin being involved. It doesn't have yep. to use GLUT4 to, to, to push glucose into the muscle. The muscle has other uh, transporters in order to, to transport glucose, but GLUT4 is, enables it to take up a bulk amount of glucose. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't need insulin. It will take in through GLUT1. It'll, it'll passively take in glucose based on substrate as needed. Yeah. Um, but it is important, the insulin stimulated GLUT4 in muscle, but it's just not nearly so big a, as might have been believed before. Right. Uh, and they, they even have mice. I'll tell you a fun one. If you like the switch off in the adipose of the glucose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They had mice where they switched off the GLUT4 in the muscle. And in fairness, by switching off that GLUT4 glucose transport in the muscle of these mice, they became insulin resistant. Sure. Fair enough. But you know what they did then? They then overexpressed the GLUT4 in their adipose tissue. They turned it up and they fixed the mice. So even if your really? GLUT4, <laughs> yes. Wow. So even if your GLUT4 is God in your muscle, the adipose is so important as a signaler. Turning up the GLUT4 in the adipose can recover the mouse while he still has no glutes for in the muscle. I said he, I, I presume yeah, some yeah. of them are. <laughs> <laughs> she mice. Yeah. <laughs> so that's actually proof positive now that uh, that the muscle is is, is, is a knock-on effect. It's, it happens further on down the line. You want to get uh, upstream to find the problem, it's happening at the at mm. the adipocytes. The, yeah, the muscle, if you do more exercise, the muscle will become more effective in taking up glucose and, and will help you. It's not that the muscle isn't important, mm. uh, but yeah, it's more recognizing that the muscle is, is a little downstream of the problem. Right. Um, in a sense. Yeah. 
So the takeaway for us listeners for all of this, what should we do to fix our insulin resistance? A ketogenic diet. <laughs> a ketogenic diet, absolutely. Um, so I would, I always go through the list and I, I might put a link to my last slide in my talk, mm. the tree of chronic disease, and it shows a lot of roots. Mm. But a big root is insulin resistance and leptin resistance and all of that. Right. And I put a lot of feeders into fixing that. Some people will have to do more things than others. Some people are more profoundly affected. But yeah. lowering the carb right down, no brainer. Moderate protein, appropriate for your body weight. You mm -hmm. mentioned that earlier. Uh, I think Richard or Carl sure. about, yeah, that's very important. Um, you want to get sun exposure, vitamin D. That's important through many mechanistic pathways. Yes. High mm -hmm. omega-3, low omega-6, no vegetable oils. Magnesium is implicated a ah, lot in the yes. insulin signaling. And Maybe 70 or 80% of people are magnesium deficient with profound consequences. Yeah. No one really knows because they're not doing the testing. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> um, I could probably mention more interestingly, if you take an example, smoking, smoking causes huge amounts of damage to your body. Yeah, Everyone it knows sure. it's full of toxins. What people don't realize is if you stop smoking, your insulin levels will drop fast within a few weeks. Interesting. Wow. So, so smoking also drives insulin signaling issues. Another one, sleep. And they're talking mm -hmm. about sleep lately. They got a bunch of US Marines and all they did was they reduced their sleep to four or five hours a night for right. a few weeks. Right. And their insulin sensitivity was halved at the end of the experiment. Wow. And they did no other intervention. So lack of sleep and stress will upset the hormonal regulation and cause insulin sensitivity problems another way. Mm -hmm. So there's loads of roots, but, but I guess if you tackle them all and you use your, the measures we talked about to say, Hey, I'm good now, mm. uh, you know, you'll get there. And, uh, yep. ketogenic is big part of it though, but that fixes a lot of other things too, not just insulin resistance, right? Sure. Therapeutic mm. for cancers, therapeutic for epilepsy. More and more, it's coming out that that it's a therapeutic therapy, not just a lifestyle. Yeah, Alzheimer's dementia, yeah. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, Alzheimer's again, they've shown now is the glucose utilization in the brain, and it's mm -hmm. kind of type three diabetes. Yeah. yeah. So it's yet again, it. we're back to insulin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is the elephant in the room. Right. It kind of is. And I really, really appreciate what you and Gabor and Dr. Gerber are putting together here. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and we will link to it as soon as it becomes available. Oh, right. Yeah. So uh, Gabor and myself, all that couple of months collaboration and I worked all through Christmas too. <laughs> Endless hmm. papers. But we've got this kind of coherent um, talk now that goes into quite some detail. And I gave it at the Physicians for Ancestral Health Winter Retreat in um, South Beach, Miami mm. last week. And that's the talk that really does the detail on, on what I touched on. Yeah. Um, so that's the one when it's available. Physicians will release it themselves very shortly. And absolute great to link to that for anyone who wants the hardcore stuff. So Ivor, it's really impressive all the research and studies that you have done. And I get people coming up to me over and over again saying, I don't know who to trust. There's so much fake news. There's so much fake science. And, and how do I know, you know, can you give us any general guidelines in terms of if we want to find out these things for ourselves and do some research, what the smells of bad research might be? Yeah, that's a, and people write to me about that quite a lot and they want to become more expert and where should they study? Where should they go? How, how do they learn how to interpret science? I, I probably say if people are interested, they really should read a couple of books about bad science and get a feel for the nefarious activity that goes on. Right. So Ben Goldacre's bad science. Oh, yes. Book, He's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, that would give you a great feeling for the kind of uh, messing. Malcolm McKendrick's Doctoring Data, I read. Ah. That one's cool. To Yeah. It shows all the cheating over the years with, with experiments and how they're biased. Oh, yeah. Or Zoe Harcombe's blog. She takes apart uh, scientific reports and shows all the flaws. And that's a great way to learn. Mm. Professor Grant Schofield in New Zealand or George mm. um, Henderson who works with them. Mm. So if you look those guys up and look at their blogs, they pick apart and you'll learn how studies are twisted. And um, 
if you really want to get serious, I mean, if you read a book um, called the, let me see, what's it called? It was my college text for biochemistry, The Chemistry of Life, fourth edition by Stephen Rose. Mm. If people really want to get into this, you want a grounding in biochemistry, and that's a great book. Um, I wonder if there are online courses that you could take in biochemistry that would give you a good uh, a good uh, substrate to use one of your words. <laughs> of, yeah, uh, you know, good foundation. Well, I believe the Khan Academy, K H A N. I haven't used it, but I've been told by good people that it's a gr they run a series of videos about biochemistry. Wow! And I believe yeah. they're approachable and free. Yeah, they're free. I believe. Yeah. And then joining groups where people are talking science. Yeah. Talking this stuff. Gabor's is pretty good. Lower insulin. Ah, Gabor's is medium core. Uh, lower insulin on Facebook. Mm. Hardcore is like hyperlipid. Okay. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's hardcore. And then optimizing nutrition, I mentioned in my talk. Marty. Sure. Uh, Marty Kendall. He was a guest on our show. That's it. I always mix it up with uh, the other Marty. Marty Kendall. Uh, and he, he goes through a lot of scientific papers. And, and there's so many more. Look to the blogs and look to the... Uh, if you take uh, Mike Eads' protein power, go through his mm. back catalog, and he repeatedly does incredibly erudite posts uh, on studies and describing where they're wrong and, and theories, and he manages to translate it for the average person. So that's mm. another protein power blog. So anyway, that's just Great. top of my head. I missed loads of people, but... Yeah. Well, we'll link to those on the show and in the show notes. And uh, so people can go to Two Keto Dudes and, you know, this is episode 51. Just go find it. Uh, insulin resistance from the bottom up with Ivor Cummins. Thank you, Ivor. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye. Wow. I never fail to be impressed by Ivor. Yeah. Speaking as a professional communicator of tech technical ideas mm. which is that's that's what we do that's what we do um uh, he's very good at it yeah he is oh, he's very good he is and i also appreciate that he he goes deep and you don't have to yes. follow him down the rabbit hole if you but if you want to he's got resources for you there it's fascinating it's all fascinating stuff <laughs>